All right, so this chapter is called Kiwen, and it's on page 212. After that, we did, no we did what we did best. We ran. A few of the main campers took the vehicles and went ahead with the two school prisoners and the body of Minerva. We all met up in two days' time. The ones who drove, the main campers who'd stayed behind to pack up, and the remainder of the failed rescue crew. We left the prisoners by the side of the road a day in. They had a tin of soup each and a blanket to share, so they'd be fine until rescue, we hoped. We buried Minerva the day after, the council holding, holding ceremony and prayer, even in the midst of our escape. Before I could stop her, Rose took scissors to her curls. When she was done, her lighter hair bounced into ringlets around her face. She didn't cry. She didn't even seem to notice. She was far away with her grief. I picked up the scissors when she put them down and cut my own braid off to send with Minerva. Afterwards, Rose, retreating a bit from her reverie, evened out my hair for me so that it hung about an inch below my ears. I hadn't felt so vulnerable since the day Mig had found me, half dead, sick from spoiled supplements, hallucinating. She kissed me when she was finished, tossing the rough edges of my cut hair into the fire. Our fight back into the valley had dissolved into this thick brew of tragedy, no more than a seasoning that we might pull out later on. We were broken, an almost unrecognizable bunch of mourners held together by habit and grief and a shared history of survival. But we still had Mig, our leader and elder, all rolled into one now, and we had the new campers and the council, so we managed to keep putting one foot in front of the other. No one said, what now? No one mentioned that we'd lost the key to taking down the schools. If they had, we'd have crumpled where we stood, no longer able to move. We traveled for 10 days before we were ensconced in pre-Cambrian rock and vicious pine. Then the group moved as one machine, setting up the main camp, stringing the woods with traps and alarms. By the end of the day two, it was as if we'd been there all along. There was even a grey muslin flag hung at half-mast by the bent bow archway in our spot. My dad surveyed the work, leaning on me for support. Well, it's not as nice as the last place, but it'll do. Summer came on quick and merciless in the next two weeks. Wab and Sheboy were officially shacked up now. Clarence taught them how to put up a teepee, and that's where they slept. When the heat brought it with its summer clothing, it became apparent to all of us that Wab was expecting a baby. The whole camp rejoiced and kept her well fed and cared for. Rose tried to be happy, but mostly she was quiet. The council spent a lot of time piecing together the few words and images each of us carried. Hello and goodbye and Cree. A story about a girl named Sedna whose fingers made all the animals of the north. They wrote what they could, drew pictures, and made the camp recite what was known for sure. It was Bullet's idea to start a youth council, to start passing on the teachings right away, while they were still relearning themselves. Slopper was tasked with putting that together, and he thrived under the responsibility. He even gave them a name, Meigwanang, Feathers. We were desperate to have to craft more keys, to give shape to the kind of Indians who could not be robbed. It was hard, desperate work. We had to be careful. We weren't making things up, half remembered, half dreamed. We felt inadequate. We felt hollow in places and at certain hours we didn't have names for it in our language. The day Rose left, I had learned how to write family in syllabic, using ash on a creamy curl of birch bark. I was sitting with the council during syllabic lesson when she walked by, slow and deliberate, sadness in her gait. She didn't say anything, but I saw the peak of her tent collapse from the cluster where it had been stood like a circus pulling up for the next town. I guess I knew it right then. I just didn't want to acknowledge it. When she appeared in the clearing, all packed up and darting her long, tearful goodbyes, collecting advice and small offerings, I took off and hid in a tangle of pines about 50 meters from the camp. I didn't want to see or hear her leave. I stayed there until the sun started to descend, hating myself every single minute. But what could I do? I had found my home, right? And I couldn't just leave my dad. It would kill him. Leaving to go back on the search would be insanity. No, it was better that we just 
stuck together and stayed clear of the schools for now, till we figured out our next move, and maybe until we'd gathered up enough odds and ends to open a door. But sitting there was torture. I kept having second thoughts that pushed needles into my feet. I, and I stood and started to run back more than once, only to stop short and talk myself back to the pines. Come on, French, I told myself. You have a good place to live and you found your dad. There's so much to learn here. What could going back into the woods possibly do? I played with Mig's pouch around my neck to keep me grounded, pulling on the mud-stained shoelace, fingering the contents through the hide. I loosed the ties a little and pushed a finger inside the top, absent-mindedly seeking purchase. There was his tobacco that jabbed under my nail and then something solid, and today my hands needed to touch something real. I had to give it back to him. We'd survived the failed ambush, and he should have it back. I pulled it off my neck and worked the cinch top open with both hands. I grabbed what was nestled in there and worked it out, tapping tobacco crumbs into my palm so as not to lose the precious flake. It was a glass vial, only half full. I spun it between my fingers and saw a label. 66542G, 41-year-old male, Euro Anishinaabe. This must have been the vial he'd ID'd as Isaac. I recalled what Meg used to tell me when I'd first come, when I was nosy enough to ask unwelcome questions and had tried to pry into the contents of that bag. It's where I keep my heart. It's too dangerous to keep it in my chest, what with the sharp edges of bone so easily broken. When I came back into the clearing, I knew for sure that she was gone. Everything felt different, smaller and bigger at the same time. As was becoming my habit when I was confused or hurt, I made my way to my dad's. He was living in a four-walled tent with a smaller table and a cot. There were some thin rugs over the dirt floor. He was sitting at the table, flipping through one of the half-dozen books the camp owned. This one was a hardcover by a great woman I had heard quoted at council named Miracle. Jojo had brought it with her from the west, where revolution was sparking along the ragged coast. He didn't seem surprised to see me and kicked out the chair opposite him for me to sit down. I sank into it and almost on cue, my eyes filled with water. I swiped at them, but eventually they were too quick for me to keep up. My father watched for a minute and then placed the book on the table in front of him. He sighed so big, his shoulders slumped where they curved out his faded undershirt, so thin I could follow the angles and ridges of his scars like tattoos under fabric. You remember how I told you about me and your mom meeting up in the city? What how happy we were. I nodded, and dislodged tears splashed on the wood in front of me. Well, I could never shake that feeling of helplessness that had brought me to the church that day back home. It was always there, like the way a blister reminds you of itself every step. Your mom, she was always smarter than me. One day, she found me drinking bootleg with a couple of the boys in Chinatown. I was supposed to be looking for work that day, but your mom, she doesn't yell. She doesn't even get mad. He paused until I lifted my head and looked at him. He was crying too, already saying goodbye. Your mother, she just looks at me real serious and says, Jean, running only works if you're moving towards something, not away. Otherwise, you'll never get anywhere. I heard this in my mother's voice, as sure as if she had been sitting on the cot behind us, braiding her hair before bed like she always did when she came to say goodnight to me and Mitch. Dad? Yes, son. I have to go. I know. I rose from the table, adrenaline pinching my calves to action, stopping long enough to hug him, and he kissed me on the top of my head, just like he used to when I was little. And I felt safe, safe enough to leave him. I rushed out of the tent at full speed, skidded into my camp, and grabbed up all my belongings. I left our tent for slopper and returned Mig's pouch, hanging it off the center pole in his tent across the fire from ours. There was no time to make my goodbyes. I knew they'd understand. Sure, my dad would explain. Besides, I couldn't bring myself to face Mig with the news of my departure and I had already lost a few hours and night was falling fast. I took off running away from the camp, the council, my family, 
running towards Rose, who was somewhere beyond the birch beaded edge of the woods, running towards an idea of home that I wasn't willing to lose, not even if it meant running away from the family I had already found. Anine! I almost tripped over my feet at the sound of her voice. Sure enough, there was Rose sitting on a log about 20 meters into the bush, her backpack at her feet. Most of her newly shorn curls were piled up on top of her head in a messy bun. A few escaped and sat on her forehead like springs. Jesus, you startled me, she chuckled. Startled? You damn near jumped out of your skin. Yeah, well, what are you even doing here? Her brow furrowed. You know what I mean. I mean, you left hours ago. I thought I was in for an evening run. I stood in front of her, not sure if I should sit, not sure if we were continuing on just yet. Yeah, well, she kicked at the dirt between my boots. Maybe I just wanted to give you a break. And what made you so sure I would even follow you? I nudged the toe of her shoe with mine. She didn't look up, but I could see the edges of a smile creep onto her cheeks. It made her eyes narrow and her forehead smooth like a pulled sheet. A hunch, I guess. Oh, a hunch, eh? I bent over, pushing my nose into the mass of curls on her head. I smelled flowers right before they burst out of their green cocoons. Yeah. She looked up, turning her face up towards mine. A hunch and a lot of hope. I leaned further in, closing my eyes in anticipation of the bright connection of her lips. Then I heard it. She placed a hand on my chest, suspending my descent, alerting me that she'd heard it too. I listened. Runners. Quiet and traveling light. I held up three fingers to indicate the number of bodies I heard pushing through the trees. They were too close for us to get a meaningful head start. We'd have to hide instead. I pointed to the ground. Riz Rose slid off the back of the log, snaking a leg up behind her and dragging her backpack as she went. I placed two hands on the mossy wood and leapt over. Landing on tiptoes and then sinking down, we half burrowed in the soggy leaves, the smell of decay and rebirth clouding around us. Then we waited. When I heard the first pair of feet stomp by, we kept our heads down. Boots. They were definitely wearing boots and not the mesh runners of the recruiters. When the second tore by, I listened harder. The dull click of a rifle butt hitting a belt. Officers traveled with handguns, not rifles. I peeked over the log. I recognized the braid flying out behind the third runner as he rushed by, holding his rifle against his side, bandana up over his nose. I stood and called out, Derek? He turned, slowing to a jog. He pointed in the direction they'd come from. Unknowns, about five or six of them, half a mile northeast. Northeast, that's the way we were headed. Rose got to her knees beside me. Gonna send out the welcome party. Derek turned and picked up speed back toward the camp. I sighed, counting the available bodies to go out with the welcome party now that Rose and I were gone. And what if they were hostile? We weren't going to be safe to continue on until we knew what was up. I was trying to find a way to delay Rose when she got to her feet beside me. Well, I guess we can wait till tomorrow. She picked up her pack, slung it over her shoulder, and started off on a slow run after Derek. Are you sure? She shouted back, can't let them go without us. That would just be irresponsible. I smiled. God, I really liked this girl. I jumped over the log and took off after her, eager for the excitement of a welcome party expedition where you didn't know if you'd find blood relatives, poachers, or strangers. Neither of us could imagine that everything would change in just a few hours, including the idea of keys. So this last chapter, it's called Lock Means Nothing. Locks mean nothing to ghosts. And it's on page 221. Derek, Rose, Clarence, the twins, Bullet, me, seven of us. Mig was considering coming, but at the last minute decided to stay back. You're just as good with that gun as I am, and Clarence and Bullet can track. I'm getting too old for this kind of thing. He settled in with my dad to annotate maps with new information. Construction sites. The burnt-out school. All right, I'll leave you old grandpas to it then, I sassed. The real warriors will take care of this. They chuckled as I sauntered away. I smiled, but it was fragile. I felt an acute pessimism at the back of my throat when they were together. How could anyone be so lucky as to have two fathers at this horrible time? 
Something had to give. Last chance, Mig. I'll give you a head start if you need it. Called over my shoulder. Nah, you go. There's no adventure out there left for me anymore. I'm done. We rolled out of camp within the hour. We didn't have much light left in the day and needed to find them before dark. Leaving it to the next day might mean we'd lose track of them, or worse, they'd discover us first. What was left of the day was gray and windy. Wind caused problems out here, with so much moisture in the air and loose dirt from both tectonic upheavals and the new species of flora tearing up the topsoil. It was like thin mud being thrown constantly in your face. I was glad for the bandanas we wore. Soon enough, we passed the place I'd found Rose waiting for me in the trees. I turned back now to watch her walking behind me, red printed fabric over her nose and mouth, a rifle slung on her slender back with a sling crafted from repurposed feet seat belts. She gave me a thumbs up and I returned the gesture. I hope we find an elder, Tree said just ahead. Someone who can help against the schools. Deep one finished. No one could replace Minerva, but we'd be lying if we said finding someone like her wasn't on everyone's minds these days. Bullets slowed a bit, so we were walking in tandem. She was wearing these three shades of denim and an old fedora, overcropped hair. This is your first welcoming party. I nodded, even though it wasn't a question. We come in full aggression. She tapped the top of her hat so that it tipped lower on her brow, trying to keep the grit from her good eye. But what if there are children in the camp? What if they're friendlies? And what if they're not? She turned to me slightly. Better to apologize later than to have to bury a friend. Or worse. There's something worse than that? Yeah, not being able to bury them. She tilted her head forward and picked up her pace, passing in front once more. Riri's face flashed in front of my eyes. I took a misstep and stumbled over a root, my rifle sliding to my side. I caught it in my hand and readjusted the black paisley splotch over my face. You couldn't let wounds take your focus out here. Soon we were crouched in line behind a cluster of rock, taking stock of the newcomers. Four tents, military style, A-frames, a small fire with a metal grate slid over top where they were cooking beans in a tin pot. One camper was washing up in an old red mop bucket with a crack down the side. He wore his hair in a floppy mullet shot through with silver. Something about his eyes reminded me of Minerva, and I wondered if they were related. My stomach pinched up. Two black women sat stirring the beans and talking about a shared memory back from the city about a play where the main actor had been too drunk to recite his lines. With their loose sentence structure and the melodic give and take allowing a team approach to conversation, I knew they were Guyanese. After the weather got violent and the islands were battered, the West Indian population here had swollen. They laughed together and I grew nostalgic for my old life. There were two other campers standing by one of the tents and it was them, if I'm honest, that made it easier for us to build aggression before we stormed in. They were having what appeared to be a casual conversation with a relaxed ease about their posture. Neither of them was armed, and one had a towel wrapped around his head like a turban, having just finished bathing, but it was their paleness that set us on edge. One man had long blonde hair, loose across his shoulder. The second in the turban had his shirt off, and he was pale except where his sleeves would have ended and the skin was burnt pink, but no old people. What to make of this diverse group? We hesitated, swinging between optimism and immediate hate. I wished Mig had come. He always knew what to do. And even when he did it, he could tell which one of us would have the pitch perfect instinct for the moment to advise. It was Derek who made the call, getting to his feet, pulling his bandana high over the bridge of his nose, stuffing his braid back into his shirt. Frig, let's just go. Days fading fast. For once, I agreed with him. We slid from behind the rocks and cut through the trees like moving water, crashing over the camp into ones and twos. I grabbed the mullet guy, who was startled, but put up no fight. Let's go, over to the fire, on your knees. The women were already on the ground, beans boiling over on their tended. They held hands while they lay on their stomachs. Bullets standing over them with a crossbow. Just relax right there, ladies, relax, and I won't be forced to use this. Derek had the long-haired blonde man by the back of the neck. He steered him over the fire and pushed him down hard into the mud near the mullet. 
who had settled back down on his considerable ass by this point. Jeez, man, watch out, okay? I'm not arguing with you. Shut it. Derek's eyes were hostile over the horizon of fabric. He pushed the muzzle of his gun into the man's spine, sending him sprawling on his stomach. Dude, all right. I'm just going to stay here, just like this. The man raised his hands above his head and folded them there, seeking reprieve. Boy, Estum, Clarence had the other man with the pink arms, hands held behind his back, walking over to the group. Enough now. We, uh, we have to assess first. He tried to cover up his careless Cree with English. We worked hard to disguise ourselves, especially our indigeni indigeneity around newcomers. Astum? The man turned his head back towards his captor, eyes wide, mouth opening to speak again. It was unlike Clarence to be violent. So what happened next was more about his embarrassment over the slip-up than his true nature. Never mind you, he growled, grabbing the man's shoulder and jerking him so violently his towel was knocked off and a shock of dark hair fell over his face. He fell to one knee in the scuffle, landing hard. Oh, Jesus, he hissed. Rose stamped her foot on the damp ground. I can't do this. She helped him to his feet and brought him over the fire so he could pick rocks out of his bloody knee. He nodded his head at her. Kinana Skomitten. Clarence and Derek exchanged a look. Rose helped the woman up next, sitting everyone in a row, one beside the other. Are you from the schools? One of the women asked. Are you? Bullet answered with a question. Us? Oh, God, no, she scoffed. We're helping to keep people from the damn schools. Bullet looked over at the mullet, who was sitting up against a tree trunk, cleaning his nails with a sharp stick. And how exactly are you doing that? The women explained that they had been nurses at the Sudbury Hospital and saw the treatments and volunteer studies firsthand. They talked about their first mission, taking children, a brother and sister, out of the program and secreting them away through a series of friends and allies. In the meantime, Clarence had lowered himself to a crouch and was in low conversation with the shirtless man who'd thanked Rose and Cree. He couldn't help himself. Clarence was a curator of Cree. He loved his language the Minerva had loved us, with pride and an enthusiasm of old potential repurposed. We stood in silence for a few minutes, weapons still pointed at our prisoners. We waited for Clarence or Bullet to tell us what came next, if we were taking them back with us or leaving them here, or I didn't really want to think about any other alternative. Derek Tree Ziguan, keep an eye on our guests, Clarence spoke up. He called them guests, so that was a good sign. And he was using our real names out loud, too. The knot of anxiety between my shoulders slackened. Rose French Bullet, a word, please. We walked away from the fire pit over behind the tents, Clarence peering into each one as we passed, looking for missed bodies or weapons. We stood in a tight circle. I could tell by her face Bullet was annoyed with our gentle handedness. What do we need to talk about? What'll, what will serve them for a bedtime snack? Clarence waved off her sarcasm. The shirtless one, one of the two pale men. He's Cree. Are you certain? It's not all that difficult for a recruiter to learn one of our languages. He could have just started speaking it when he heard you use it first. Bullet was sharp. Clarence sighed, kicking a rock by his foot. I know, that's on me, but I am certain. He's speaking an old Cree I don't even fully know. He's way more fluent than me or anyone else I've met and walked his lineage back. And what about the others? There's only one native in the bunch, especially the, this Cree in disguise. Bullet was still skeptical. They're allies, real allies. They put their lives on the line. It's not just talk. You heard them, Clarence insisted. There may be... Wait. Rose cut him off. Is he as fluent as Minerva was? I saw right away where she was headed, so I stated the obvious. But he's not old. I mean, not elder kind of old. Why does he have to be old? She was excited now. I could see it flashing in her dark eyes like the clouds of fireflies that made summer nights frantic with light. The key doesn't have to be old. The language already is. We stood there for a moment. The wrinkles in Bullet's forehead smoothed out like a sheet pulled tight. 
Clarence, I said. We need to ask him something, then we'll know. He nodded. I walked back to the fire, grabbing a red checkered fur shirt from a low branch by the last tent. The twins were standing over the nurses in the niche, their guns pointed towards the ground. Derek was watching the two men. He kept his rifle trained on the small space between their heads. I, pull, I put my hand on his shoulder and squeezed, letting him know I had this. I threw the shirt to the man Clarence had spoken to. He nodded gratitude and pulled it on, buttoning the front over his damp, damp skin. How do you dream? He looked up. It wasn't so hard to see his nation there. It was there in his light eyes, the way they angled down and avoided roundness just slightly. It was in the right corners of his high cheeks and the smooth flatness of his lips. It was there in the question he posed back with just the movement of his eyebrows. I mean, what does it sound like? Come again? I sighed. I hope he wasn't in a mood to stall. What language do you dream in? He smiled and his lips parted to show rows of bright teeth. I already knew what he was going to say. Nahiyawak, big man. I watched the word leave his mouth, felt it fall over my face through the cotton damp with breath and mud. It raised the skin on my arms to bumps. I dream in Cree. I looked back over the small council and nodded, smiling. Pack him up, Clarence called out. We were getting close now, passing the log once more. I slowed down, hoping to walk with Rose the remainder of the trip. Instead, I ended up beside the Cree. He smiled, so I tried to make small talk now that we were able to tuck our aggressive bravado away. Even Bullet had softened, smiling at the back of the line while the nurses laughed and teased each other. So how long have you been in the bush? Oh, years. Too long. Were you always with these people? I've been with Talia and Helen, the nurses, since the beginning. They're the ones who helped me get out of the school. I was brought into their hospital for blood work to determine my eligibility. And well, here we are. He put air quotes around eligibility. What do you mean, eligibility? He pushed air out his nose and smiled, full of bitterness. To make sure my blood wasn't too mixed. Can't catch a break for being a half-breed any way you look at it. I stayed silent. My family didn't really have those problems. No one mistook us for anything other than what we were. I wondered if we were lucky or not. My family. My stolen family. How did you stay alive in there? My voice betrayed the small sliver of hope sliding under my skin. I heard it's pretty grim. I had somewhere I needed to be. He pushed back the hair from his forehead. Someone I needed to be with. And that's when I saw it, the dark lines curving from his middle knuckle rounding the ridges of vein, settling just under the cuff of his plaid sleeve, a tattoo of a buffalo on the back of his hand. Isaac? His eyes grew wide. He dropped his hair so that it swung back into his face and his feet slowed. How do you know my name? That bundle I carried in my chest, the one that inflated when I heard about our triumphs, the one that ached with our losses, the same place where my love for Rose nested and the painful memories were enshrined and mourned. From there came the push, and I set off running. French! Hey, what's the matter? Tree yelled after me. I couldn't answer. I had to get to Mig now. The moon was hoisted to the center of the sky as I ran, a big stage spotlight among the smaller bulbs of stars. It illuminated the green expanse between trees and the rocky outcroppings, that marked the start of our camp. The grass here was waist high with clusters of sleepy blooms nodding their heavy heads in the blue light. I ran into the clearing, pulled my breath in to yell. It burned all the way down to my throat, into my belly. Meek wands! A crow, startled by my small commotion, alighted from a branch to the right, cawing his displeasure, staccato of anxiety, stitching the night a darker blue. A short silence was followed by the quick shuffle of feet and the bouncing strobe of flashlights in hand. A small group came into view from the des denser pines by the rock. I bent in two, hands on knees, gasping for the air to call the mig to me, to us. 
Make wands. The group spoke low amongst themselves and there was movement. I raised a hand to block out the glare and saw Mick pushing through the bodies to the front of the group. French? I laughed out the next ragged breath. I didn't know I was crying until I closed my eyes and the water dropped onto my cheeks, hitting the backs of my hands. I took a step towards me, then stopped and shone his flashlight into the trees. There was crashing behind me as the others caught up. I turned my head, still bent over to catch my breath, expecting Derek or Quick Bullet. But it was him. It was Isaac at the head of the party. He slowed to a walk now, the welcoming party and newcomers falling in behind. He slowed all his movements as if focusing his eyes and reconciling what they saw took motion from his muscles. I heard a sound like an echo turned inside out, and then Mig, who had been standing still, trying to see, to understand, under the blue smoke of moonlight, finally took a step forward. Meekwans, is that you? Isaac's words jumped up his throat like heartbeats, each book ended with a pause, then settling into the grass like blood coagulating. He couldn't move for it. I couldn't breathe. Mig opened his mouth. The movement unhinged his leg, and he fell to his knees, knocking down the grass like so much chaff. He held his hands out, palms turning upwards in a slow ballet of bone, marrow intact after all this time, under the crowded sky, against the broken ground. Isaac! I heard it in his voice as Miguans began to weep. I watched it in the steps that pulled Isaac, the man who dreamed in creed, home to his love the love who carried him against the rib and breath and hurt of his chest, a ceremony in a glass vial. And I understood that as long as there are dreamers left, there will never be want for a dream. And I understood just what we would do for each other, just what we would do for the ebb and pull of the dream, the bigger dream that held us all. Anything. Everything. Okay, so that's the end of the book. Um, Marrow Thieves by Sherry Dimeline. So thanks again for joining in um, and I hope uh, you enjoyed reading with me.